I will just do a quick recap of what we saw last time, just three, four lines. So remember last time, um, consider it L, which was the set of all lattices. And see, right? And such a lattice was just this uh, two dimensional linear combination of z omega 1 plus z omega 2, where omega 1 and omega 2 are somehow uh, linearly independent over r. Right? So really something that's periodic and two-dimensional. And we saw the uniformization theorem. Uniform theorem. Okay. For elliptic curves. And what did that say? It said that this set L mod homotheity. And I'm going to notice mod C star because C star induces all the homotheities. We saw that this set is isomorphic to the set of all elliptic curves. Um, over C, right? Mod C isomorphism. And now what was the map we considered there? We considered this map from C mod lambda. So if you pick out one of these lattices, for lambda and L, then our map was this maps to E lambda over C, which is the elliptic curve given by the equation y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus uh, g3, right? And g2 and g3 were constants of the lattice, and the map is the following we map z onto this tuple given by this wire stress p function that we saw. We said lambda and uh, first derivative with respect to z and lambda, right? And again, g2 and 3, there were some constants depending on lambda. And we also saw the other direction, right? Going from e into the um, z lambda. So really this is an isomorphism in a sense. And we also saw the other direction where we took an elliptic curve and computed these, um, what did we compute? These periods, omega 1 and omega 2, and these periods did just uh, correspond to a lattice. Okay, and again, how did we define when two elliptic curves were isomorphic? We had that E lambda 1 is isomorphic to E lambda 2, um, if and only if uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 homothetic right so basically when we could scale one into the other by an invertible element in C so lambda one is C times lambda two okay that's what we had and today actually we would like to look at the set L a bit closer so now let me um, there is everything so today, um, let's look at actually at lambda. No, no, let's look at the set L mod C star. Okay, so now we really want to consider all these lattices up to homotheity. Because what's interesting for us is, is all the elliptic curves mod isomorphism. Because Two elliptic curves that are isomorphic, we should just count them really as the one thing. So we, we really, by looking at this set, we really look at uh, the set of all isomorphism classes in a sense, right? And now for for a lambda in L, right? We had that we wrote lambda as z omega one plus z omega two, and now we want to pick an orientation. Uh, for omega 1 and omega 2 and the orientation that we're going to pick is simply that we want these pointing to the right and up 
So omega one and omega two, just choose them like such that the arrows are pointing right into the up, and that will be our orientation. And if that's not the case, well, then you simply swap omega one and omega two. And again, we saw that two of these lattices are homothetic. Basically, they give us the same element in, 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 in here. Well, if we can scale them. So what we're going to consider for this lattice here is we will simply scale it by one over omega two. And what this is going to do is that in the end, we're going to consider this lattice as at omega one over omega two plus z, and then we're going to call this simple tau, okay? And um, by picking the orientation like we did, we can assume that the imaginary part of omega one over omega two is bigger than zero, okay? We can assume that I'm tau is bigger than zero, and therefore we should probably consider all the complex numbers in the upper half plane, okay? So we're going to consider um, H, which are all the tau and C, such that the imaginary part of tau bigger than zero. And that's just the upper half plane. Okay, and that's why statistically we denote it by H. Now, if you think of this map, H into the set L mod C star, then you send tau onto lambda tau, which we just choose as set tau plus Z. And this is certainly surjective. So for all these lattices in here, there exists an element in the upper half plane, but it's not quite injective yet. But not quite, quite injective. Okay, because again, there could still be some transformations left that induce homothetic. And what we're going to work out now is what exactly has to be fulfilled uh, to, to make sure um, such homothetic happens in the upper half thing. Now, for this, we will just consider two lattices. Uh, well, I mean, we will consider a lattice and a homothetic lattice to that. So in reality, it's going to be the same lattice. So let's write down two bases. So omega one and omega two. And the second base is omega one prime and omega two prime bases for, for a lattice lambda. So really what's happening here is that omega one prime can then be written as a linear combination of omega one and omega two. So a omega one plus e omega two, omega two prime is c omega one plus d omega two, right? So you can think of drawing a lattice and maybe scaling it or rotating it. You know, when you rotate a lattice, you just get a linear combination from the old vectors. And now, if we if you consider this as a linear transformation really what you have is that you consider a matrix let's call it a um, with the entries a b c d and that's just acting on the vector omega one omega two right in c square now because this is a linear transformation and these are all nice complex numbers um this matrix here actually is invertible okay and If we want this to be a set basis, then we better have that all of these um, entries have integer entries. So A, B, C, D, there should be integer entries. And if this matrix is invertible, um, the same argument applies. So all the entries in the invertible matrix, uh, in the inverse matrix also should all have integer entries. Now there's a there's a small calculation that you can do. So if you look at the imaginary part of omega one prime over omega two prime, then if you if you just go through with the calculation, what you find is that this gives you AD minus BC times the imaginary part of omega one over omega two over some absolute value. And if this is just C times omega one 
over omega 2 minus d square okay and we said that this here should be bigger than zero and if this one here is bigger than zero and if this one is an absolute value well then it follows then a d minus b c better be bigger than zero right so we had that a was invertible and we had that the determinant here is bigger than zero and all the entries are integers well um it doesn't leave us much for the real determinant therefore the determinant has to be plus one right because i um, mean the determinant of the inverse is just one over the determinant and if the matrix has all integer entries then the determinant has to be an integer and so the only thing that that this leaves us is determinant one so in the end which matrices are we going to consider we're going to consider the set of all matrices a b c d yeah such that a b c d are integers and such that the determinant of this matrix is one and another name for the set is just sl2z right the special linear group two by two the set entries okay that's pretty nice so from this we can write down a nice theorem so a lattice given by call one is homophadic to a lattice given by determined by tau two if and only if yeah, for tau one and tau two in the upper half plane now that's something we're going to assume if and only if there exists uh, a matrix a b c d in sl2 z yeah such that we can write down tau 2 as this mobius transformation of tau 1 right a tau 1 plus b over c tau 1 yeah this should be this should be tau 1 c tau 1 plus d okay and maybe you see in complex analysis this is called a Möbius transformation okay and this is the first point that we find and then we find another point so if we take a lattice in c then we can always find a tau in the upper half plane such that lambda is homothetic to lambda tau i mean there always existed a mobius transformation that sends us exactly into the upper half plane so what this really gives us is it gives us a group action of sl2 z acting onto the upper half plane as follows namely we act with gamma on an element tau in the upper half plane and we simply send it to a tau plus b over c tau plus d if gamma is one of these matrices right a b c d so this will go this is going to be a nice group action this is something you have to show right you just have to make sure that this uh, that it associates uh, through over the elements but just believe me that this is true so now we're going to do a little trick Earlier we said that we wanted to know really what this set is, right? But we now know that all of these elements in the lattices, they can be defined by, by lambda tau, right? So really, if you want to make sure that you don't double count, you better mod out by all the homothetes. This is what we're going to do here, right? We mod out by all the homothetes. But what does this really correspond to? Well, really it corresponds to taking the upper half plane because we said we can always find an element in the upper half plane and then two lattices in there are homothetic well if there exists one element in sl2 set that sends them between each other so we should also mod out by the action of sl2 set okay so this is a nice one-to-one -one correspondence and 
we simply take an element tau in the set and send it to lambda tau. And this now is really all the lattices at the home of the AD. So really, this allows us to pick out one and only one representative of this isomorphism class. And there's a little better that we can do because we can take the element minus one, which is just the minus identity matrix. And then you can check for yourself that this actually acts trivially on uh, on the upper half plane right so you should also mod out by by this element just to make sure you have the, the smallest possible set and if you do this we find the following group which we call gamma one and i will tell you why this no notation is a bit suggestive so we're going to define gamma one as sl to z yeah mod plus minus one Right, because we said these elements, they just fit everything in variance. So you might as well just mod out. And sometimes, sometimes this thing here, we call the projective special linear group to Z. Okay. Now, there's a little remark here that's not contained in Silverman's book, but I thought it might still be interesting to make it. Um, there's another thing that you can consider, which is gamma N. Okay, and gamma n are actually congruent subgroups of gamma one. So you define gamma n as all the a, b, c, d's in gamma one, such that a and d are congruent to one mod n, and uh, b and c are congruent to zero mod n. So basically all the elements in here that are congruent to the identity matrix mod n, right? And then you have to, be, to, to work a bit for the result, but you also find that you can consider gamma one mod gamma n, and turns out this is isomorphic to SL to Z mod n Z. Okay. And yeah, again, mod plus minus one, right? Anyhow, and this is something that's my first remark and then also the second remark. And this is something that Sean should know, namely that SL2Z is arithmetic. So it's an arithmetic group. It's a lattice in, in SL2R. Um, and one nice thing that you get out of all of this theory is that gamma one, it acts uh, properly discontinuously on H. Okay. So what does this, this thing mean? It's a bit of a lengthy definition. So this just means that um, for all compact um, A, B in H, you have that um, if you take a gamma in gamma one, then if I shift A away by gamma one and intersect it by B, then this intersects only in a finite number of points. Okay. So one way you can think of it this is that this, this set is really, really discrete in terms of action and orbits. And what's nice here with this is, so this, this, is, a, this is a nice point. Um, if you have a set X and you have a group G acting on a set X, and X now I'm assuming this is maybe not even a set, it's just some house door space. And if I have a group G acting on X properly and discontinuously, then this induces a, a covering map, namely from X into X mod G. Okay, and this, this is really a covering map. Okay, and maybe there you can see why it's important that this, uh, this intersection of compacts, that this is finite. 
because this will correspond to somehow the fibers going up into into the big set again by by discovering that and uh, we will actually see this construction a bit later in in for for our set uh, for our upper half plane set now let's look at the group PSL2 set a bit closer so we're going to single out two elements namely the element s which is 0 minus 1 1 0 and we will single out this element t which is just 1 1 0 1 uh, in gamma 1 okay and if you play around a bit with these elements is then you're going to notice that s square equals 1 and st cubed equals 1 so what you find is uh, you find finite namely two finite subgroups right that's important you find two finite subgroups um, of order two and one of order three and in fact what you can show okay the also an exercise maybe if you're keen that gamma one is isomorphic to the free product of uh, two cyclic groups of the cyclic group of two elements and the cyclic group of three elements okay this is free product okay <clears throat> and maybe this is something you can show now what i would really like to do is i would really like to single out one orbit in the upper half plane so a fundamental domain and this leads me to the following proposition we're going to single out the set f which are all the tau's in h such that tau is bigger than one and the real part of tau uh, is bounded by a half okay and it turns out this is a fundamental domain so for every element in the upper half plane I can find one element in PSL to R, uh, PSL to Z, that uh, acted upon one element in F sends me to that target. So, in other words, for all tau and H, there exists a gamma in gamma one, such that gamma tau lies in F. This just goes the other direction, right? So, for every element in the upper half plane, I can find a transformation that brings me back into F. And there are three interesting points in this set. I'm just noticing this for noting this for completeness here. So there is I, there is rho, and there is minus rho, and they are stabilized in F. And all the element, uh, all no other elements are stabilized by by PSL to set. And rho is just uh, this root of unity here by I over three. Okay. Now. Let's have a bit of a look how this F looks like. So this is my lower half plane. I don't really care about that. Right. And everything above is the upper half plane. And zero is here, one half is here, one is here, minus a half is here, and minus one is here. I is up here. So I'm going to draw this half circle. And uh, the fundamental domain, as we said, is exactly this set, right? And I mean, this goes all the way up to infinity. So this set in here, this is F. And then if I act on F by the element by this matrix S, then it sends me into this set here. And then I think I, I drew this a bit better in my notes. But there are a few other elements that can send me to other places. So STS sends me in here, ST sends me in here, TS square sends me in here, TST sends me in here, and so on and so forth. I mean, you get the idea. So there are many, many, many fundamental domains, but uh, taking this one is just comfortable. Okay. Now, what we're going to do here is a bit funky. So what we're going to do is we will mod out H by gamma one. 
And what this corresponds to is really all the lattices the elements in L mod C star. Right? But we had that the mapping from H into L mod C star by just sending tau onto lambda tau, this was surjective but not injective. Okay. So really this map here was defined up to uh, gamma one action. Okay, but now if we actually mod out here by the gamma one action, then we should really get a one-to-one -one correspondence. So H mod gamma one, this really classifies the lattices in C up to homotheity. Right? And we saw that the lattices in C up to homotheity, this really corresponds to all the isomorphism classes of elliptic curves over C. Okay? And there's some funny thing we can do, right? Because earlier we said we had this group G, which acts properly and discontinuously, which acts on the set H. So this is some sort of covering map, but it turns out that um, if H is a nice manifold, or if we can say, if we could make H into a nice manifold or some Riemann surface with a complex structure, then this whole thing could be made into a Riemann surface with complex structure. And that's actually what we're going to do now is, we're going to equip um, gamma one mod H, I mean, we have to we have to modify it a bit, but we what we we will just add a point just to make sure it's nice and compact. With uh, with a complex structure, and make it into a Riemann surface. Okay. So how do we do this? Because H is not quite nice and compact. So really what we're going to do is we're just going to compactify it by adding a missing point or maybe some missing points. Actually in our case, we only need to add a point, but maybe later in a future lecture, we'll see that sometimes you have to add more than one point, but always just a discrete set. So by, by adding missing points. Okay, now let's see how we do this in our case. So let's make this definition. We're going to define H star as the upper half plane. And then we're going to add a copy of the, uh, the projective one space over, Q, over the rationals. And really what this is, this is just H and the rationals, all the rational points, and then we just add a point at infinity. So now we're actually adding way too many points, okay? But sometimes you just, you just need to, feel, later on if for our generalized um, Riemann surfaces, we will need a, also to take into account a few points in Q. But in this case for gamma one, it'll turn out that all these points in Q are actually going away again. So really what we're going to consider H is H and infinity, but you know, one step after the other. Now, the points in in P1, in uh, protective one space, uh, we're going to call the cusps of, of H star. Okay, this is just some um, old notation, old definition. And now what we're going to define are these two sets for now namely y1, which is just h1 mod gamma1, and we're going to define x1, which is h star mod gamma1, right? And well, so the points in x1 without y1, this is now a set minus, 
not the mon anymore. So they are the cusps. Right? Of x1, I guess. Okay. And in our case, turns out what you can show is that x1 minus y1, this is really just the point in infinity. Okay. And just for completeness sake, again, the stabilizer of this point are all the matrices of the following form 1b01 in gamma 1. Okay, with a free variable b. And well, this was just all the matrices generated by this matrix T that we saw earlier. Okay. And now there would be a very, very lengthy calculation and lots of stuff to show to make sure that we can actually find a nice, a nice Hausdorff topology in X1 and that we can find a nice complex structure and whatnot. So really what you want to do is you want to find a nice uh, Hausdorff topology on X1 and you find, want to find complex structure, make it into a manifold, to make it into a Riemann surface. And for that, I will just refer you to uh, the Silverman book because it would just be kind of a waste of time to go through all the details here. Just in the end, okay, in the end, after this lengthy process, what you end up with is that you can consider X1 as this Riemann surface, just a Riemann sphere. And uh, point at infinity up there. So it's just a two sphere. Okay, which is compact, house door, all the good things. And we call x1 the modular curve. x1 okay and curve here this suggests some algebraic structure now why is this a curve why is this a curve well it turns out over the complex numbers right that this Riemann sphere is really just isomorphic to complex projective one space and complex projective one space, this is just a complex line, the, the complex projective line, right? And a line is a nice projective curve. Projective curve. Okay. And so really what we have is that all the points in x1, right, and can consider all these points in x1, what they're going to correspond is some lattice lambda tau, right, maybe lambda tau 1, lambda tau 2, and so on and so forth. And every point on this curve x1 gives me a different isomorphism class of elliptic curves. And in fact, it gives me all possible isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. So what I have found now is I have found a curve which parametrizes elliptic curves. It's not an elliptic curve itself, it's just a projective curve, but it's a curve for which each point parametrizes for me one possible elliptic curves curve over the complex numbers. And that's why we call it the modular curve because moduli in, in, in uh, algebraic geometry are somehow invariants that, that define objects for me. And this modular curve is a curve that contains all these moduli, okay? And for us, X1 is a simple example of a so-called moduli space. Okay, so the points 
in x1, they give us the possible elliptic curves, uh, say e tau over c, right? But then I'm making a little clip here, modulo some problems. Okay, because in general, a moduli problem is actually a bit more complex than that. And so for x1, really, we find also this point at infinity, which is not, not quite a good point. Because it doesn't really correspond to an elliptic curve. So rather we should have considered y1, right? But y1 was not compact. We didn't really have a nice complex structure on it. So calling y1 this moduli space is not, not quite the right terminology again, and it, it, it wouldn't have been a curve. So really what x1 corresponds to is, um, is the set of all elliptic curves and this cusp here, okay? And so in the end, we'd rather have uh, a more proper somehow um, definition for what a moduli space really should be than just this naive thing that we chose here. Okay. And there are also more problems if you consider these moduli spaces over different fields. There are the problems of non-trivial automorphisms that I'm just going to mention here if you would like to look it up. But hopefully in further episodes, maybe we can talk a bit more about a good definition of what a moduli problem and what a moduli space should be. And then we might talk a bit about the cores and find moduli spaces and all these things. But for now, I think this is, this is plenty enough to have seen an example of how these things could look like. Okay. Now, mm, so we have this isomorphism here, right? From x1 into v1c. And can we actually find this map? And it turns out we can actually find this map. Okay. And for our purposes, we're going to call it J, which is going to be a map from x1 into p1c. And we're going to call this the J function. And we will soon see, maybe in 10 minutes or so, how to define this actually. But first, we need a bit of a more general definition, namely that of a modular function, finally. Okay. So we take some integer k in z. Okay. And we take a function f of tau on the upper half plane. Then we call f weakly modular, weakly modular of weight to k. Okay. And this is all for gamma one, right? So you could also consider the gamma n groups later that, that I mentioned earlier. But for now, let's just stick to gamma one. Um, if, and we need to have two properties. First of all, F should be meromorphic on the upper half plane, right? So find that number of poles and whatnot. And um, two, F, if I translate by an element in PSL to Z, then there should be a functional equation of the following form. Namely, I want this to be C tau plus D to the 2k times f of tau for all uh, gamma in gamma one. And again, if you want to consider a different group, then these gamma would be from the other group. And for all tau in h, right? And this was just the matrix A, B, C, D. Okay, and why do we only consider even weights here? Let me just make a quick remark here. So if we actually consider an odd L, 
yeah then f of gamma tau i can find a transformation if we follow this transformation this functional equation so this would be c tau plus t to the l right times f of tau and if i now choose gamma to be the following matrix minus one zero zero one then if i plug everything in i get that f of tau is minus f of tau yeah but this forces um, f to be zero everywhere right so really it only makes sense to consider even even weights okay so there wouldn't be any modular function of odd weight now um remember we had this matrix s earlier which was zero minus one one zero and if i think about what that does to my f any modular function f then f of tau plus one would be f of tau so really modular functions are one periodic right that's what i find so i might as well just um, consider the fourier transformation of these things so let's define fourier parameter q which is says e to the two pi i tau then the function f has a fourier expansion in the parameter q as follows this is just a n times q to the n right so f tilde is the fourier expansion of f okay and now i can have a look at what happens with these fourier expansions right because i could plug in um i could let my tau go to infinity and then see whether the fourier expansion blows up there or not right whether we have a pole at infinity or not so depending on, on whether we blow up or not we can make two definitions we can say that f is meromorphic at the pole or has a pole at infinity yeah um, if the Fourier expansion looks as follows um, it starts from some negative index n0 goes all the way to infinity a n q to the n and we call f holomorphic at infinity so it's well behaved there then if my Fourier expansion doesn't really have any negative modes right so if n starts at zero in this case right and in this case the order of vanishing at infinity would have an n-fold pull and in this case the order of vanishing or oh yeah no yeah i mean it doesn't oh it doesn't it doesn't really have a pole there right in this case f of infinity is just finite it's just a zero right i mean you can see this by remembering that q is e to the two pi i tau right okay now a quick definition so a weekly modular function um, which is meromorphic at infinity this is called a modular function okay and a weekly mod function which is holomorphic everywhere okay so basically on the upper half plane and at infinity because we started with uh, being meromorphic everywhere but now we really want something that's holomorphic everywhere this is called a modular form modular form okay and one other name that's often used 
if f of infinity is actually zero, then we call this a cusp form. Okay, sometimes you see you see this uh, this nomenclature. Now, finally, can we maybe see an example of modular functions? Well, remember in the lecture last time, we actually looked at this Eisenstein series, right? And we also index them by by this k. Turns out actually this is a weight. So we had t to k of some lattice lambda tau. Now what did we do? We just summed this reciprocity formula over all points in the lattice. So really what you do is you sum over all m and n instead. Um, such that m and n are non-zero, and we summed one over m tau plus n to the 2k, okay? And turns out g2k is weakly modular of weight 2k. Okay? Now, what did we have last time? We had G2 of tau, and I think this was 60. Um, G4 of tau, and we had G3 of tau, which was 140. G6 of tau, and this would be weight four. This would be weight six. And then I can define a function delta of tau, which is called the modular discriminant, which is really the discriminant of the defining equation of the elliptic curve, which was g2 cubed minus 27 g3 of tau square. And this is a modular uh, function, a weakly modular function of weight of weight 12. Okay, but now I can actually build something, something nice from this. I can build this function j, which is one seven two eight g two of tau cubed over delta of tau. Okay, and turns out the j of tau is the j invariant of the following elliptic curve, eta equals y square, eta given by y square equals 4x cubed minus g2 of tau x minus g3 of tau. Okay. And maybe I can fit this down here. There's a theorem the j is exactly this function that sends my modular curve x1 isomorphically into a projective one space. Okay, and that this is a modular function of weight zero. Okay. So, Maybe at some point we will see um, the J invariant defini defined algebraically, but this somehow is the, the modular curve definition of the J invariant. And what you actually see if you look at it algebraically is that the J invariant is an isomorphism invariant of an elliptic curve. So if you have an elliptic curve E1 and an elliptic curve E2 and they're algebraically isomorphic, then it turns out they have the same J invariant. And this is something we find again here, right? If I consider the same isomorphism class of elliptic curves over the complex numbers, then we said they should have homothetic lattices. And then what we did, we um, modded out by the action of PSL2Z on the upper half plane. And PSL2Z, um, this basically sent lattices to homothetic lattices, right? So this would allow us to walk in this isomorphism class. So in the end, we really find what we expected in the first place, that J is somehow a nice isomorphism invariant. And now here we have um, 
that for different tos on our um, on our Riemann surface on our two sphere, we really find these J invariants that that parameterize all the possible elliptic curves over C. Okay, and I think with five minutes left here, this is a good place to stop, and then next time we can see how we go from here to somehow more involved uh, structures. Well, anyhow, thanks for listening today. <laughs>